Hello Skeletons, it is Disney Queen Skelly here, and welcome back to my, well, not welcome back, but welcome to my first ever true crime story on this channel. As you guys know, I have wanted to incorporate horror into my channel um, for a while now, and I have finally done that. And for today, we are doing a true crime story. This series is uh, one true crime story for every 50 states in the United States. So today we are starting with Alabama, so I hope you guys enjoy. Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. Unfairness in the justice system is a major theme of our age. DNA analysis exposes false convictions, it seems, on a weekly basis. The predominance of racial minorities in jails and prisons suggests systematic bias. Sentencing guidelines born, on, born of the war on drugs look increasingly draconian. Studies cast doubt on the accuracy of eyewitness testimonies, even in the states that still kill people appear to have forgotten how. Lately, executions have been bot botched to horrific effect. This news reaches citizens in articles and television spots about mistreated individuals, but Just Mercy, a memoir, aggregates and personalizes the struggle against injustice in the story of one activist lawyer. Brian Stevenson grew up poor in Delaware. His great-grandparents had been slaves in Virginia. His grandfather was murdered in Philadelphia Housing Project when Stevenson was a teenager. Stevenson attended Eastern College, now Eastern University, a Christian institute outside Philadelphia, and then Harvard Law School. Afterward, he began representing poor, citizen, poor clients in the South, first in Georgia and then Alabama, where he was a co-founder of the Equal Justice Initiative. Just Mercy focuses on that work and those clients. Its narrative backbone is the story of Walter McAllen, Walter McMillan, whom Stevenson began representing in the late 18, 1980s when he was on death row for killing a young white woman in Monroeville, Alabama, the hometown of Harper Lee. Monroeville has long promoted its connection to, to To Kill a Mockingbird, which is about a black man falsely accused of the rape of a white woman. As Stevenson writes, sentimentally, sentimentally about Lee's story grew even as the harder of the book took no roots. Walter McMillan had never heard of the book and had scarcely been in trouble with the law. He had, however, been having an affair with a white woman, and Stevenson makes a persuasive case that it made McMillan, who cut timber for a living, vulnerable to prosecution. McMillan's ordeal is a good subject for Stevenson, first of all because it was so outrageous. The reader quickly comes to root for McMillan as authorities gin up a case against him, Ignore the many eyewitnesses who were with him at church fundraiser at a church fundraiser at his home when the murder took place, and send him before trial to death row in the state pen. When the almost entirely white jury returns a sentence of life in prison, the judge named Robert Ely Key takes it upon himself to convert it to a death penalty. Stevenson's is not the first telling of this miscarriage of justice. Sixty Minutes did a segment on it, and the journalist P. Early wrote a book about the case, Circumstantial Evidence. 1995. Macmillan's release in 1993 made the front page of the New York Times, but this book brings new life to the story and by placing it in two affecting contexts, Stevenson's life work and the deep strain of racial justice injustice in American life. Macmillan's was a foundational cause for the author, both professionally and personally. This exoneration burnished his reputation. A strength of his account is that instead of the Hollywood movement moment of people cheering and champagne popping when the court finally frees Macmillan. Stevenson admits he was confused by my suddenly simmering anger. He found himself thinking of how much pain had been visited on Macmillan and his family and committee and about others wrongly convicted who hadn't received the death penalty and this and thus were less likely to attract the attention of activist lawyers. Stevenson using uses Macmillan's case to illustrate his commitment both to individual defendants, he remained closely in touch until Macmillan's death, and to endemic problems in America, and American ju jurisprudence. The more success Stevenson has fighting his hopeless causes, the more support his, he attracts. Soon, he has won a MacArthur Genius Grant, Sweden's Olaf Palm Prize, and other awards and distinctions, and is attracting enough federal and foundational support to field, a whole to field a whole staff. By the second half of the book, they are taking on mandatory life sentences for children, now abolished, and broader measures to encourage Americans to recognize the le le legacy of slavery in today's criminal justice system. 
As I read this book, I kept thinking of Paul Farmer, the physician who was devoted to his life, devoted his life to improving health care for the world's poor, notably Haitians. The men are roughly contemporaries. Both have won MacArthur grants. Both have a Christian bent and Harvard connections. Stevenson even quotes Farmer, who it turns out sits on the board of the Equal Justice Initiative. Farmer's commitment to the poor was captured in Tracy Kidder's Mountains Beyond Mountains, and Kidder's advanced praise adorns the back of Justice Mercy. A difference, and one that worried me at first, is that Farmer was fortunate enough to have Kidder as his boss well, relieving him of the awkward task of, extro of extolling his own good deeds. Stevenson writing his own book walks a tricky line when it comes to showing how good can triumph in the world without making himself look solely responsible. Luckily, you don't have to read too long to start cheering for this man. Against tremendous odds, Stevenson has worked to free scores of people from wrongful or excessive punishment, arguing five times before the Supreme Court. And as it happens, the book extols not his nobility, but that, of course, and reads like, and reads like a call to action for all treatments to be done. Just Mercy has its quirks, though. Many stories it recants are more than 30 years old but are retold as though they happened yesterday. Dialogue is reconstitu recon reconstituted, scenes are conjured from memory, characters' thoughts are channeled a la true crime writers. Macmillan, being driven back to death row, was feeling something that could only be described as rage. Lose these chains, lose these chains, he couldn't remember when, he, when he'd last lost control, but he felt himself falling apart. Stevenson leaves out identifying years, perhaps to avoid the impression that some of these happened long ago. He also has the defense lawyer's ref reflex of refusing to acknowledge his client's darker motives. A teenager convicted of a double murder by arson is relieved of agency. A man who placed a bomb on his estranged girlfriend's porch, inadvertently killing her niece, had a big heart. For a memoir, Just Mercy also contains little that is that is intimate. Who has this man cared deeply about apart from his mother and his clients among the dis dispossess dispossessed. It's hard to say. Almost everything we learn about the, his personal life seems to, be, seems to illustrate the lawyer struggling for social justice. An exception. A scene where he is sitting in his car, speeding a few minutes alone, spending a few minutes alone, listening to Sly of the Family Stone on the radio. In just over three years of law practice, I had become one of those people whom such small events could make a big difference in my joy quotient. But there's plenty about his worldview. As Stevenson says in a TED Talk, we will ultimately not be judged by our technology. We won't be judged by our design. We won't be judged by our intellect and reason. Ultimately, you judge the character of a society by how they treat the poor, the condemned, the incarcerated. This way of thinking is in line with other pronouncements he makes throughout. The opposite of poverty is justice. They are like fr phrases from sermons, ex exhortations to righteous action. The real question of capital punishment in this, count in this country is, do we deserve to kill? The message of this book, hammered home by dramatic examples of one man's refusal to sit quietly and countenance horror, is that evil can be overcome a difference can be made just mercy will make you upset it will make you hopeful the day i finished it i happened to read in a newspaper that one of the 10 people exonerated of crimes in recent years had pleaded guilty out at trial the justice system had them over a log and copying a plea had been their only hope brian stevenson has been angry about this for years and we are all the better for it all right, little skeletons, and that is it for my first ever true crime story on this channel. I do apologize if there are a lot of cuts uh, in between that. I am not feeling exactly good right now. I've been doing a lot today, and, you know, uh, like I said yesterday, I do have a lot going on. Uh, the time of recording, and it's just been a lot, and it's overwhelming. So if I do seem a bit off, and there's a lot of cuts in between, I am very sorry. I am trying my best. I hope you guys understand that. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed today's true crime story, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye little skeletons, stay safe, and I love you guys.